Good morning. We've been talking about picking up your cross and following Jesus, and, and I can almost guarantee you that none of you saw somebody walking around with a cross on their shoulders this last week. Anybody see cross, somebody walking downtown by Arco Arena with a cross on their shoulders? Or? Don't you remember? There was, about two years ago, there was a guy that came. No, I mean this last week. Oh, no. Just this last week. <laughs> Anybody see this at work or at school? Somebody walking around with a cross? See, here's the thing. As believers in Jesus, we know in his word, he's commanded. Okay, now God has commanded. God's commanded that every disciple of his, anybody that wants to follow him, you've got to pick up your cross and follow him. So what are we missing? If we didn't see a single person picking up their cross and following him this last week. Does that mean there's not one single believer in Sacramento? Is that what it means? No, it doesn't mean that. So how are we to understand then how by faith and obedience, because if you have faith in Jesus, that means you're obeying him. How are we by faith and obedience in Christ picking up our cross and following him? And we've been talking about this for a couple weeks now. We've talked about how we follow Jesus and we do what he did, and we sacrifice our life of sin to follow him in a life of righteousness and faith and love and peace and the power of his gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we pick up our cross, and we're focused on five key things, ministries, areas of life, that we live in a balanced way by faith in Christ, that we pick up our cross, put to death all of our old sin, our old way of living, and we live in a new kingdom lifestyle, a new life of faith in the resurrection power of Jesus, filled with His Holy Spirit, literally here and now, today. And we do this five key ways. We talked about how we love God with all our heart, mind, and soul in worship and prayer. So every day we live a life of worship and prayer, intimate worship, intimate prayer with Jesus every single day, not just Sundays. And it's awesome and it's powerful to have the God of the universe actually speak to you every single day. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. And so every single day you can hear the God of the universe speak to you. And the first way he does that by his Holy Spirit is through his word, his living word, his eternal word. By his word, the heavens were made. By the word from Jesus' mouth, every star, every universe, every planet, every atom and every molecule was shaped by God in an instant. Wow. And that God speaks to you. The second one we looked at was service, the ministry of service. That Jesus said, I did not come to be served, even though he's God Almighty. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. He came to serve. And he washed the disciples' feet. And so we pick up our cross every single day by serving others. And every single morning, you can lay in bed when your eyes first creep open. Or maybe your eyes pop open and you jump out of bed with a spring under you. But however you wake up in the morning... You can ask God first, Lord, who can I bless today? Who can I serve today? In any act of kindness, any act of faith, any act of loving them in Jesus' name. So we are servants, all of us. If we are disciples and we're living like Jesus, we are all servants. And one thing I have grown to love and brag about for you guys, and I'm bragging in Jesus here, is that there are so many in this congregation that are amazing servants of God. I mean, amazing servants. And they live a life of service for Jesus Christ. And I look at you and eyeball to eyeball, and I, I can see, I can see in my mind all the things I've seen you do. Now, you don't get to see this because you're not here most days of the week. I get it. But I'm here most days of the week, and I see the acts that so many of you do that are invisible to the rest of the congregation because it's not done on Sunday morning when you're here. And I get to see the things that you have done over the years that I've been here, and I praise God for you. 
I can look at you right now and I'm not going to remember the things you have done. And I praise God for your service because you sacrificially serve. And most of the time, you do it with a smile on your face. That's the only way to do it, by the way. If you're grumbling, complaining, we need to have a talk. <laughs> so this morning, we're going to look at the third way. We've talked about picking up our cross through worship and prayer, and it has to start there. We have to start by responding to God's love and loving him in return in worship and prayer. And then we talked about serving, being a blessing to others. However, God has gifted you. Today we're going to listen to the Word. And we're going to let God Almighty and His Holy Spirit speak to us and help us understand how we can pick up our cross and follow Jesus by listening and believing and acting on what's called obedience, the Word of God. The same Word that created this planet. The same Word that created Adam. And then by hand, God shaped Eve. And he breathed life into both of them. God created with a word. And then, the miracle of miracles, God came from heaven to earth. God incarnate, God in flesh, Jesus Christ. And he is the word of God. So I invite you to stand. We're going to read John 1. 1 through 14. Please stand for the reading of God's word if you're able. And it is my prayer, it's been my prayer this week, that this morning the Holy Spirit will plant in your heart, in your soul, in a fresh way, God speaking to you his word, that Jesus is the word, and that your love for him would deepen and become alive in a fresh way this morning. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by Him. And apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for a witness that he might bear witness of the light that all might believe through him. He, John, was not the light, but came that he might bear witness of the light. There was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name who were not born of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. You may be seated. The centrality of the Word of God is something that most Christians will give lip service to. Would you agree? Most people that claim to be Christians will claim that the, the Bible is the Word of God. And they'll claim, oh, yeah, that's, that's God's Word. <clears throat> but then during the week they won't read it. The last statistic I read said that the average American Christian, North American Christian, has five Bibles and doesn't read any of them. They collect dust. Do you see the problem we have? 
Can you understand perhaps how we have gotten as a country so far away from God and his way of doing things because we're doing things our own way and not his? In John 1, 1 through 18, we see that Jesus is the word. The word in the Greek that was written by John was logos. It's a Greek word. And it's a transcendent word. It is an amazing word. If you started doing research in the Greek language to what logos means, that's one deep word. It is not an easily understood concept. But trying to keep it simple and clear, it simply says Jesus is God. Jesus is the creative and reasonable power controlling and ordering all of creation. That's the clearest summary you're going to find on the word logos. You can read pages on this. But Jesus is the creator and the one who orders all of creation by his word. In John 6, 68 to 69, we see that Jesus has the words of eternal life. And here's a really bizarre situation. Jesus has done all these amazing miracles and thousands and thousands of people are following him. More thousands than can fit in the new Golden One Arena. I mean 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 people, right? And they can't all fit in Golden One. And these crowds are following Jesus. He can't get away from them. So then in John 6, he begins teaching them something that is absolutely ugly, repulsive, and abhorrent to every Jew. He says, if you want to be my follower, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Interesting that he used that language because we're having communion today. And he says, my flesh is given for you. My blood is poured out for you so that we can have a new life in him. And there's a lot of, of deep understanding and all the deep, deep mystery that Jesus embodied and made clear for us. He gives us this truth from heaven. But the fact is, he told the Jews, eat my flesh, drink my blood. And they were disgusted by that and they left. Thousands upon thousands. Not exactly the way most people say to build the church today. You know, say ugly and repulsive things and get them to leave. That's what Jesus did. And then he turned to the 12 because... They were repulsed by these words too. They were Jews. And Jesus turned to them and said, you going to leave too? And Peter responded, Lord, where will we go? You have the words of eternal life. For some amazing, miraculous reason, the Holy Spirit got through to his brain and he understood when he's standing before Jesus, he's standing in front of the incarnate word of God. When you hold the Bible in your hand or you hold your smartphone and the Word of God's in it and you're looking at the Word of God, you're looking at Jesus. Have you ever realized that? And when you speak to God and He speaks to you from His Word, your shepherd, Jesus Christ, is speaking to you from His Word. This is His Word. And when He speaks to you from His Word and you listen and believe and obey, you and the Good Shepherd are just... You're, you're doing great. Your shepherd speaks, you listen, you obey. This is the living word of God for us. It's the word of eternal life. In John 7, 38, Jesus says, Believe in Jesus as the scriptures have said. And the scriptures that the Jews understood in that day was the Old Testament, which is, you know, I'm going to hold this up here. Just give you a physical idea of the Old Testament without the new. There we go. That's the old. I'm holding the old right there. This is the new. So it looks like two to one ratio there, right? This is the word of God the Jews had. It's the word of God the Jews still have. And these are the words that Jesus said, this is the word of God. This is the gospel. And if you understand what God has said, what I have said, then you understand me. You want to know Jesus? Know his word. As the scriptures have said. In John 8, 31, Jesus began talking about abiding in his word. Abide. You know, that's not a common word for most of us. Anybody use it this last week? Even, not even the last one, just the last week. Anybody? 
Well, you abode in your home. That's where you abide, right? But we don't usually talk about that. But there is a place where our stuff is kept, where our bed is, where we sleep, where we, normally we cook, we eat, we, you know, normally we take a shower, those kind of things. That's where we abide, the center of our life. And Jesus is saying, the center of your life has to be in me. I'm glad you said amen, but I, I want you to stop for just a second and consider what Jesus is challenging us with. How many of us have the center of our life in something else? When I was a church planning pastor in Southern California, I was sharing with a husband and wife in their apartment, and the reason I'm telling you this story is because the center of this guy's life, he's a young man, his early 30s, now the center of his life was not Jesus Christ. The center of his life was matchbox cars. This guy had the Smithsonian collection of matchbox cars. He could win the Olympic gold medal for the collection of matchbox cars. He had the collection to beat every collection of matchbox cars. He lived matchbox cars. Now, I've never seen a grown man with this many matchbox cars. And when I was a little boy, I played with them. I like them. But as a man, not so much. <laughs> and yet this man lived this. He breathed this. This is all he wanted to talk about. My point? Jesus is saying, if you're going to follow him, that you have to abide in him. And he will abide in you. That's his promise. He makes that promise. So he wants you to have the center of your being in him. And so that you delight to talk about him and listen to him and hang out with him and you know, enjoy his company. And that all of your life is in him. And yet how many of us, if we actually wrote down a list right now of, Say the top five things that take your time day to day. Would you say Jesus is the top of that list? Or would it be laundry, dishes, you know, paying bills, mowing the yard, chores, grocery shopping, you know, all that stuff, right? The stuff of life that there is no end of. Can we just say that? There's no end to dirty dishes or laundry, is there? No. But is it supposed to be the center of our life? Mm -mm. Neither are our hobbies to be the center of our life. Yesterday I enjoyed a wonderful motorcycle ride. It was awesome. I could tell you all about it. I'm not going to. <laughs> the point that I'm making is that I prayed before I prayed during, I prayed after. The entire time I was enjoying my motorcycle ride with my friend, also on another motorcycle, we had a great day riding. I was in prayer and worship, thanking God, just actually praying for some of you as God brought you to my mind. But I spent the whole day enjoying Jesus. I was abiding in him as I was riding my motorcycle. My point is this, no matter what we do, our life is easily centered in Jesus. Easily. So we can do laundry in Jesus, literally, and enjoy him in that moment. We can do our dishes, literally washing dishes, and enjoy Jesus. There is a wonderful little book called Practicing the Presence of God. If you don't have it, I recommend you get it. You can probably get it an e-version for free. It's an old book, comes from the Middle Ages, from a monk named Brother Lawrence. How about that, Lawrence? Brother Lawrence. And he wrote this book. And you know what his job was in the monastery? Washing dishes. And he wrote this little pamphlet because he enjoyed the presence of God in all things he did. And so Jesus is inviting us to abide in him. It's a command, folks. So is the center of your life Jesus and the center of what you do Jesus and the center of what you think Jesus. 
because this is how we are to pick up our cross and follow him and make the word of God the center of our life. In John 8, 51 and 14, 23, Jesus says, keep my word and you'll enjoy eternal life. I don't know about you, but from time to time, I do struggle keeping his word. Because if we're going to obey Jesus, that means we don't sin. And I cannot stand before you and tell you that I'm sinless. I'm not sinless. I would like to be sinless. Would you like to be sinless? Absolutely. But from time to time, I become impatient, angry. You know, just list any number of sins, right? I'm capable of them all. I stand before you a sinner. Saved by grace. Thank God, right? And we're all, we can all say that. And I'm abiding in Christ and walking in his spirit. And when I do that, wow, freedom from sin, freedom from those problems, not freedom from the world and its sins and problems, but I'm, I'm free from my own. And that's a glorious way to be. That's a wonderful feeling. And Jesus said, if you'll just keep my word, just keep my word. <laughs> now, I've got to ask you this one simple question. Is Jesus' word 100% right 100% of the time? Amen. Amen. Yes, it is. We can just jump up and shout hallelujah right now. Amen. It's perfect. Is your way ever 100% right? Okay. Then, whose way are we going to follow? Jesus. Jesus. Let's just say that one more time with a little feeling, okay? Whose way are we going to follow? Jesus. Amen. Let's keep his word and enjoy life with him. Not just when we're dead and in heaven, because our eternal life is right now. We are alive in Christ at this moment. And you do not die. Your body does. You'll lay this thing down. It's just a temporary tent, folks. We are alive in Christ right now, and we will be with him forever. Amen. Amen. So let's keep his word and enjoy this life in Christ. Enjoy eternal life with him starting now. In John 10, verse 4, 10, 16, and 27 through 30, Jesus talks about himself being the good shepherd. And we're his sheep. Amen, we're his sheep, because otherwise I'm a lost sheep. I don't want to be a lost sheep. Been there, done that. Didn't like it. Don't want the T-shirt. I want to be Jesus' sheep. Amen? Amen? Okay. Let's listen to his voice. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. Are you listening to the voice of Jesus? Literally. I mean this literally. Do you take time to listen to your shepherd daily? I'm not talking about me. I appreciate you listening right now, but I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about the shepherd who died for you on the cross, was buried in the tomb, and then raised on the third day according to his word. God Almighty, Jesus Christ, he's your good shepherd. Are you daily listening to his word? Do you make time and physical space to be alone with your creator, God, who loves you more than anything else? I'm challenging you right now to grow in your prayer life and spend more time listening to your God who loves you. And as he took his disciples frequently away from the crowds, away from their work, even away from the ministry, to go to lonely places to be alone with the Father and pray, I'm challenging you to plan your life to spend more time with Jesus, listening to him by going away to a lonely place. We call these places today retreat centers. <laughs> A quiet place, a lonely place, a place that you can turn your cell phone off and nobody's going to bug you, right? You go to a quiet, lonely place 
so you can have space and time to listen to your good shepherd who loves you. This is the greatest blessing you can imagine. Henry Blackaby put it this way. He said, if you have trouble listening to God, if you have trouble hearing his voice, you have trouble at the core of your relationship with God. Jesus made it clear. My sheep hear my voice. So make time to listen to your God who loves you. And the Holy Spirit will teach you things you do not know. The Holy Spirit will give you understanding of mysteries from God that no other person understands. He will give wisdom to the church that the world will never get. He will teach us and bring us to our mind's remembrance, renewal in the Holy Spirit, holiness in the Holy Spirit, Enlightenment. Jesus is the light that gives life. Amen. And so in John 14 and 16, we're told the Holy Spirit is sent by God the Father to us to give us understanding of Jesus, to help us remember everything he said. Now, you and I weren't there the three years he ministered in Israel. But this promise from God is transcendent. It, it is not limited by geography or time. And so when Jesus said, my Holy Spirit, whom the Father will give you, will bring back to your memory everything I've taught, he meant it. God is not bound by space or time, and so he will bring to your mind things you do not know. Isn't that amazing? But you do know the requirement. You have to listen to him. Because Jesus has spoken. Your God has spoken. The creator of the universe has spoken. And he's speaking to us that we may have his peace and his joy. Again, I ask you a simple question. And you can answer God. You don't have to say anything out loud to me or your neighbor. Just talk to God. Do you have all the joy and peace of Jesus that you would like to have? Do you have enough? Like, oh, no, I'm, I'm good, God. I've got an extra box in the pantry I don't need anymore. Got all the peace and joy of Jesus that you want? Like, I'm full up, don't need any more. Got no more room, Jesus. Can't take any more joy. Or would you like a little more? Could you, could you stand just a touch more of Jesus' peace and joy? What do you think? A little more? Sound good? I think that sounds wonderful. I think it sounds miraculous. So what do we have to do? Because Jesus has spoken to us that we may have his peace and joy. Well, it goes back to the beginning of this lesson. We have to abide in him. We have to listen to his voice. We have to make space and time to listen to his voice. Make him the center of our life. How do we physically do this? How do we pick up our cross and make the word of God, Jesus, living and active, the center of our life, in John, excuse me, in Matthew 7, Matthew 7, 24 to 27, Jesus told a, a short parable, and the people didn't get it. Parables are kind of mysterious spiritual stories, but here's the bottom line. The story had two houses, one built on sand, one built on rock. And the big storm came, you know, Category 5 hurricane. Blew down the one built on sand, nothing left. The one built on rock? Everybody's inside having a party. No problems. They're enjoying the presence of God. Solid in their faith. Jesus said, my words are the rock. Build your life on me. If we build our life on anything else, including politicians, you know what I'm talking about. I'm not talking badly about any politicians. I'm just saying, if our faith is in anywhere else other than Jesus, we're building on sand. We need to pray for our politicians, pray for this election. I mean that with all humility. Pray, pray, pray. Be loving, be gentle, be the light of Christ. But let's abide and listen to Jesus and his eternal word. Amen?
Let's build our life on the rock, not the sand. Which means we have to practice this. Anybody here a master builder? You know, some of you are pretty handy with tools, but I don't, I don't know anybody that would call themselves a master builder, right? So the only master builder I know is Jesus. And if we will come to him in humility and faith, he will help us build our life on him, the solid rock. And here's how. Uh, there's a couple places I'd like you to consider looking in the next week, the next month, the next year. Uh, Psalm 119. You've got that right there in your notes. How do we pick up our cross? Psalm 119. And also, Deuteronomy 6. I'm going to read a few words here. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. But this is one of the first places where God gives the command to love him to his people. The Jews still recite this to this day. This is like the cornerstone of their faith in God. Deuteronomy 6, verse 1. Now this is the commandment, the statutes, and the judgments which our Lord God has commanded me, Moses, to teach you that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it, so that you and your children and your grandchildren might hear the Lord your God, fear the Lord your God, to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you all the days of your life. So from birth until we go to heaven and that your days may be prolonged. Oh, Israel, you should listen. Listen to the word of God. Listen and be careful to do it that it may be well with you and that you may multiply greatly. How many of you want more grandkids? Okay, multiply greatly. Just as the Lord your God of your fathers has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words, the living word of God, which I am commanding you today, shall be on your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children, to your sons, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You remember what I said about abiding be the center of your life? Everything you do is centered in the word of God. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and there shall be as frontals on your forehead this is meant that everything you put your hand to, every activity you participate in, and everything you think about is to be centered in the Word of God. How trouble-free would your life be if every thought first went through the Word of God and if everything you did with your hands was guided by the Word of God? We would never sin. Live this way. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Make this the center of your life. So, love, seek, and keep the word of God. Love God and his word. Seek God and his word. Keep God and his word. Memorize the word of God. Walk in his word. Consider his word. Contemplate his word. Live his word. Meditate on his word. Sing his word. Pray his word. Give testimony to his word. Teach the word to your children and your neighbors and your co-workers and people you meet on light rail. Teach the word of God. Enjoy. Not argumentatively, but enjoy. Because it's so exciting, because so it's, it's so life-giving. There's so much joy here, and I want to share it. I want to share good news. This is how we pick up our cross and follow Jesus, by making his word the center of our life, the foundation of all that we are. If you make anything else the foundation of your life, it's going to rust, it's going to crumble, it's going to disappear. Only Jesus and his word is eternal. He's God. He's inviting us and commanding us to live this way. How do you want to live? With the word of God active in your life or collecting dust on a shelf? choice is ours. The life and joy and peace of Jesus is right here, right now, every day.
for you. We're going to share communion now according to his word. So I'm going to read just a brief passage from 1 Corinthians 11 so that we can prepare our hearts. If you have your Bibles, you can turn 1 Corinthians 11. I'm going to start in verse 17 because this is Jesus speaking to us. The Lord's Supper. But in giving this instruction, I do not praise you because you come together not for better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part, I believe it. Maybe it was an election and there were Democrats and Republicans. For there must also be factions among you in order that those who are approved may have become evident among you. Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. He's talking about the problem that congregation has. For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this I will not praise you. For as I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes back. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, that is, you have active sin in your life, shall be guilty of the body and blood of Jesus. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat the bread and drink the cup, for he who eats and drinks eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many of you among you are weak or sick and a number sleep, that is, are dead. But if we judge ourselves rightly, we shall not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord in order that we may not be condemned along with the world. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you are God Almighty. You are our Savior who gave your body and blood on the cross. You set us free from sin and Satan and death. You've given us freedom. You've given us healing. You've given us the gift of life in you, with you, the Father and the Spirit. You've given us the church, brothers and sisters in Christ supernaturally. You have done all this. So now, Lord, in obedience to your word, we do share the bread and the cup together. We do this in faith in you. We do this by faith in the new relationship, the new covenant. We do this to take all that you are and to all that we are so that you would make us holy, so that you would abide in us, so that we would be in obedience to you, empowered by your spirit to bear your fruit in our lives. Lord, if there is any sin in us, we ask your Holy Spirit to reveal it to our hearts and minds right now that we would confess it to you right now. That we would repent from it right now. And that you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us.
from all unrighteousness immediately. Lord, thank you for your forgiveness and healing and cleansing. Enable us now by your spirit to take this communion together, united in your spirit. Lord, make this congregation one of one heart, of one mind, that we would be one as you and the Father and the Spirit are one, according to your Spirit. Lord, glorify yourself here now as we share your body and your blood in obedience to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.